So now we're going to derive the Jeffreys prior for theta, where theta here represents the probability of our coin landing heads up. And we're using a random variable x to describe the outcome of this coin flipping, where x is zero if the coin lands tails up and one if it lands heads up. So as I said previously, the Jeffreys prior in terms of theta is proportional to the square root of the information matrix. And we know that the information matrix I of theta, it's just a scalar now, is equal to the negative or minus one times the expected value of d2l over d theta squared, where the little l here represents the log likelihood. Firstly, let's come up with an expression for our likelihood. So the likelihood l of theta conditional on some value x is just equal to, for a Bernoulli random variable, theta to the power x times one minus theta to the power one minus x. So that means that the log likelihood, which I'm just gonna write as little l, is equal to x times log of theta plus one minus x times log, I'm running out of space here, of one minus theta. So then we can differentiate the log likelihood with respect to theta, and I should say here that the logs that I'm using are natural logs, so we just obtain x over theta minus one minus x over one minus theta. If I differentiate that again to work out the second derivative, which we need to work out our information matrix, we just get here minus x over theta squared minus one minus x over one minus theta, all squared. And then to work out our information matrix, we just take the second derivative of the log likelihood, times it by minus one and take the expectation of that. So here we just get the expected value of x over theta squared plus one minus x over one minus theta squared. And here, theta is not a random variable, x is. And the expected value of x for a Bernoulli random variable is just theta. And that makes sense because if you repeatedly flip a coin, then the average value of x will be the proportion of the time that your coin lands head up. So if I just go through and apply the expectation operator, which is a linear operator, we just get theta over theta squared plus one minus theta over, it should be one minus theta all squared on the bottom here. So it should just be one minus theta all squared which is equal to one over theta plus one over one minus theta, which when you combine just becomes one over theta, one minus theta. And note that the way in which I've combined here, I've just used a sort of shortcut here. Really what you would do is you'd cross multiply and, and add the two terms there, but I've already worked that out sort of off the screen. So what does that mean that Jeffrey's prior looks like here? Well, the idea is that Jeffrey's prior is proportional to i of theta to the power of a half, which is just equal to one over theta to the power of half, one minus theta to the power of half. And this functional form is exactly the same as that of a beta half half distribution. And we can plot what this kind of density looks like so theta here being a probability is just bounded between zero and one. And here we have P of theta, our Jeffreys prior, looks something like the line which I'm drawing here. So it should kind of bottom out at theta is equal to a half. And then it asymptotes towards theta is zero and theta is one. So you can see here that Jeffreys prior very much is a non-uniform prior in terms of theta here. So why does Jeffrey's prior take this shape? Well, the idea is that it is essentially reflecting the shape of the likelihood. And the reason for that is that if you obtain some data, which looks like it could have been the result of theta being equal to a half, in theory, there are a wide variety of possible thetas that could have generated that data. 
And because of that wide variety of possible values of theta, that means that we have quite a lot of uncertainty in terms of theta for values around or estimates around theta being equal to a half. Whereas if we obtain data which is characteristic of theta being close to one, so for example, if we flip our coin 10 times and every time our coin lands head up or heads up, so we just get ones every time, it's much less likely that that could have been generated by a wide range of theta. So we're that much more confident in terms of our theta value. And similarly, if we obtained all zeros, we'd also be quite confident in terms of our value of theta. And so the prior here is chosen to reflect the nature of the likelihood. When I've been constructing, sort of hand-wavingly so, these intervals of uncertainty here, the idea is that I was doing so using the method of maximum likelihood. And the method of maximum likelihood uses, unsurprisingly, the second derivative of the log likelihood, or the expected value of that, in other words, the information matrix, to work out these confidence bounds. And hence, Jeffrey's prior is just trying to align with this as best as possible. It's trying to let the data speak for itself. Now what I want to do is step two in our kind of original diagram, which is to work out Jeffrey's posterior in terms of theta. And this is fairly easy to do because we already know what the likelihood is. The P of x given theta is equal to theta to the power x, 1 minus theta to the power 1 minus x. And Jeffrey's prior P of theta has the functional form theta to the power minus a half times 1 minus theta to the power minus a half. So that's just exactly the same as what I've got up here. I've just used minus powers to or negative powers to represent that fraction. So because the posterior is proportional to the product of the likelihood and the prior, we just obtain the functional form of the posterior p of theta given x is proportional to the product of these two things. So we just get theta to the power x minus a half times one minus theta to the power half minus x, which if you compare that with beta densities is equivalent to a beta half plus x, three over two minus x. But that's not too important for our current discussion, but just to bear that in mind, because essentially we've used a conjugate prior to our likelihood because it's a beta prior, which means that we get out of beta posterior. Now what I wanna do is I want to apply the change of variables rule. In other words, we're gonna use our Jacobian to derive what the posterior is in terms of our parameter psi. And the way in which I always try and remember how to do change of variables is remembering that essentially whatever probability distribution we have, whatever parameterization we have, then the integral of that probability distribution must always be one. So if we have our posterior p of theta given x and we're integrating that with respect to theta, so theta here is bounded between zero and one, it's a probability, this must be the same and also equal to one as the integral from zero to infinity of p of psi given x integrated with respect to psi. And psi here, just for clarity, is equal to the odds, so theta over one minus theta, which is bounded at the sort of minimum with zero if theta was equal to zero, and it's maximum at infinity where theta is equal to one. So that's why I'm integrating between zero and infinity here. And essentially to derive the change of variables rule, all we do is we take away the integral sign, so we get p of theta given x times d theta is equal to p of psi given x times d psi, which we can then rearrange to obtain, in this case, p of psi given x is just equal to p of theta given x times, I'm running out of space here, d theta over d psi. So now I've just rewritten our change of variables rule for clarity, and so you can see it a bit easier. So let's now apply it. Well, we know that psi is just equal to theta 
over 1 minus theta, which you can rearrange to show that theta is equal to psi over 1 plus psi. And you can see here that as psi is always non-negative, then psi over 1 plus psi is always going to be less than or equal to 1, equal to 1 in the limit that psi goes to infinity. Okay, now that we have theta in terms of psi, we can work out d theta over d psi. So d theta over d psi is just equal to, if we just use our quotient rule here, we get v, which is the denominator here, 1 plus psi, times the derivative of the numerator, which is just 1, minus u, our numerator, times the derivative of the denominator, which is also just 1, all divided through by 1 plus psi, our denominator, all squared. So we just get 1 over 1 plus psi, all squared. And now, because we have p of theta given x just being equal to theta to the power x minus a half times 1 minus theta to the power a half minus x. And all we do now is we just substitute in for psi. So that gives us, in this case, we just get psi over 1 plus psi all to the power x minus a half times 1 minus psi, which you can work out is just 1 over 1 plus psi, to the power half minus x. And then if you just collect powers of psi, you just get psi to the power x minus a half. Because it turns out that the denominator terms just cancel out with one another. Which means that we get an expression for our posterior, psi given x, or p of psi given x, which is just equal to psi to the power x minus a half, divided through by 1 plus psi all squared. And so this expression is the thing that we're going to be trying to work towards via the other kind of route to get here, which is to work out, firstly, Jeffrey's prior in terms of psi, and then use that to work out Jeffrey's, I should, there should be an S there, Jeffrey's posterior in terms of psi, which we will show is equal to this term here. And just quickly, one thing I've noticed, really what I should be writing here is that p of theta given x is proportional to this term here. So similarly, p of psi given x is also proportional to rather than equal to this functional form here. 